Alan Beam, always good to have you on the program. Welcome back to the studio. It does look like all leaks are starting to converge here around a story that tells us Australia gets three and up to five Virginia-class submarines. Then after developing local industry, it gets to build a new class uh, alongside the UK primarily in this country. Some details are still rather scant, though. On what we know so far, does this sound like a well-conceived endeavour, in your view? Um, I th I'm sure that a lot of thinking has gone on behind this and uh, although it's got a bit of feeling of clutching at straws, I mean, we don't know what the follow-on submarine will be that the Brits will make and if it's anything like astute, it will be plagued with trouble and take 30 or 40 years, which is what astute has taken. So there are a lot of sort of threads that are uh, left out there but I think what the government has done is brought this sort of funny issue to a head by announcing a decision which has at least some plausibility. Um, it's a bit on the never-never. Uh, I don't think that there will be any budget projections at this point. That will be certainly not in the next budget. And it feels it's going to be outside the forwards. So it means that for at least the life of this government, it's not going to come home to roost financially. Sure. So it's, um, yeah, a bit up in the air still. OK, but the first sort of tangible sign we have of this coming together, apart from rotational visits by US and UK nuclear-powered submarines, is the delivery of these Virginia-class boats to Australia. Now, that looks like being in the 2030s. Um, is that doable? I know you say nothing's happening in the, in the next three to, to four years, but um, does that sound like... Uh, no, it delivering? is doable. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm certain it's doable. Uh, at what cost is the question? Mm. And where are you going to put those costs? How are you going to invest? Uh, are we going to invest in uh, a third yard in the United States to build a few additional Virginias for us? Are we going to get... A, a few Virginia-class submarines that might have been repaired in the United States. There are actually quite a number that are requiring repair. Um, that is not an attractive avenue, I don't think. Um, our experience in Australia of acquiring a second-hand US kit is not happy. Mm. Uh, some of your listeners will remember Manura and Canimbla, Rusty which, uh, ships, which yeah. were just rust buckets, mm. and they cost us more to fix than they did to purchase. So I think we'd want to go into that particular uh, decision with our eyes wide open. All right. Why don't we go to the why question? Uh, are you fully convinced? I know you've had your doubts at different stages on this journey about the need for this capability, particularly with all of its offensive capacities, able to fire dozens of Tomahawk cruise missiles. Does this seem right for Australia this century? Good question, Greg. It, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. That's why we've just had the Defence Strategic Review. My own position has been not about the what, but about the how. Mm. Um, I have no doubt that we need, in our force structure, we need submarines, we need quite a number of them, uh, and we need them to be able to do quite particular jobs. They're essentially to sink an adversary's surface ships and its submarines. That's a very, very big task. So we do need that. And the argument for nuclear propulsion, I think, has been at least for consideration for quite a long time now, and that is for reasons of endurance and speed. That's the what. I have no doubt about that. How? That's where I have some concerns. Right. Um, how are we going to do this? Does it make sense to get a 10,000 tonne submarine from the Americans or an 8,000 tonne submarine from the British? Or might there have been other avenues that we could have looked at in the long period that this has been boiling around in our heads? Right, but that, you know, that ship has sailed as they it has say. sailed. So they've, they've scraped up the best options, presumably, that they have available to them at the moment. What about on the personnel front? Uh, considerably more crew are uh, required than would be needed mm. in the current fleet of Collins-class submarines. Put into some perspective for us the enormity of, of that challenge. That's more than doubling our current submarine crew numbers and doubling the number of, of trained officers. And when I say it's more than that, because you've got to have uh, a feed program 
and then you have the operators who are rotating over a number of years and then they go on to other command positions. So you've got quite a long tail mm. that attaches to the operation of submarines. It's a huge task because many of the skills that we require for nuclear propelled submarines and new systems are skills that we actually don't have in Australia. We can't teach them here. So a lot of the officers and uh, some of the, the uh, other ranks are going to have to go and do quite advanced courses in Britain or the United States to get up to speed. That's in engineering, in propulsion, in systems operations, a big, big task. I've seen some suggestions, and they were only suggestions or speculation, I think, that you might end up with a situation where you have an American captain uh, in, in command of an Australian-owned Virginia-class submarine. Does that seem uh, plausible or implausible to you? Look, I think that's plausible. Um, we do have exchange arrangements already. And um, if you look at how we operate our long-range maritime patrol, the, the Poseidon and formerly the P3s, mm -hmm. it was not uncommon to have a British or an American or a Canadian uh, as captain of the aircraft. Um, he was in command of the aircraft because he was seconded. Uh, now, his being in command of the aircraft didn't put him outside the Australian command chain. So the fact that it might be an American or a Brit who is captain of the submarine, yeah. I think, is not material because they'll be acting under the direction of the Chief of the Defence Force, essentially. Okay. So I'm not worried about that. All right, interesting uh, parallel there that you draw. And it's not only uh, the Defence Force with which you are familiar, Alan Beam. Uh, you've advised politicians a plenty over the years too. Can I just get some perspective on where you think this all-absorbing endeavour sits within the priorities of the Albanese government? It's going to capture lots of attention this week. But uh, do you think it'll runs any risk of overrunning their domestic political agenda at all? That, again, is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty good question, Greg. But my feeling is that we'll have a lot of political theatre tomorrow. It's not often that um, an Australian Prime Minister, a British Prime Minister and the US President get together on the deck of an aircraft carrier in San Diego and next door to a... Virginia-class submarine. I guess all of the props will be there. I think that this will out theatre, Mr Morrison's theatre from March last year. Okay. Uh, but I think it is, it is the last performance. Um, I think what the government is very keen to do now is to get this off the table, get a, a set of decisions taken for implementation sometime in the future, uh, get back to the major political priorities that the government has got, which are mostly in the social policy area. Mm. Um, AUKUS, I think, has taken up a lot of bandwidth, it's taken up a lot of time, and I suspect that the Prime Minister and the Cabinet would be pretty keen to get back to heartland Labor issues and deal with those because they've got an election away there in 18 months' time yeah. and they've got to get a few things done. They've also got to get an economy to be able to pay for all of these things, the AUKUS submarines included. Alan Beam, as always, uh, really interesting views expressed here. We'll do it again before too long. Thanks okay. for joining us. Thanks, Greg.